Hello, and welcome to part four of this mycotoxin series. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit different. Um, instead of just talking about environmental chemistry and toxicology, I'm going to talk about a bit of a social issue, um, and this is the inequity of exposure to mycotoxins. So a lot of us take for granted that our food supply is highly regulated and is tested for safety and um, is tested to be free of some things like mycotoxins, but that's not the case around the world. And in some parts of the world, um, that regulation isn't even really feasible at the current moment. So mycotoxins such as aflatoxin, um, to summarize some previous episodes, um, they are chronic toxins and they may cause things like liver cancer is one example. Um, if we look at the liver cancer rates, so the hepatocellular carcinoma rates around the world, um, you can see there's definitely some hot spots, and these hot spots are usually in the tropics, and they're usually in the countries where um, there is less access to medical care, or countries where um, the food supply is a little bit um, unstable. Um, so places like Africa, we see China there, we see um, you know Indonesia, Malaysia. Uh, and even like Central and South America. Um, so there are a lot of factors leading to this hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm not saying this is all just due to aflatoxin exposure, but aflatoxin is a significant part of this and something that shouldn't be forgotten when you're um, addressing the public health in these regions. So aflatoxin, as mentioned in, I think even episode one, um, Aspergillus flavus is the, um, the mold there that produces it. And in certain environments, um, that aspergillus really thrives. So this is environments where it's warm, where there's lots of water, um, environments where there's little access to technology. So um, maybe farming equipment is, uh, is not like the, the best that it could be or drying equipment or food storage. Um, these are places where that mold can really thrive um, and places where people would be at more risk of exposure. So again, we look at that, that map with the rates of hepatocellular cellular carcinoma, and um, you can definitely see the tropics are affected. Now, um, just to clarify again, this is not all because of aflatoxin. Um, the next map shows the hepatitis B um, infection rates across the world, and you can see definitely Africa um, and then China. But what you don't see so much though is like in South America and Central America, we still had high cancer rates, um, but the hepatitis rates aren't any different from, um, you know, they're maybe a little higher, but not um, super different from places like Europe or the United States. Um, and a lot of this is generated. We know aflatoxin is carcinogenic. We know it can cause liver cancer, but in humans, we think that's uh, pretty mild. It takes pretty high exposure um, because we are all exposed to aflatoxin a lot, and we are not all having um, struggling with hepatocellular carcinomas. But if you throw hepatitis into the mix here, um, multiple studies have shown that that risk of hepatocellular carcinoma um, it increases by two to five times when these two are together versus when you're just exposed to one or just exposed to other so like if you look at the same population with same aflatoxin exposure with or without hepatitis those with um, hepatitis have much higher levels of cancer and vice versa um, you look at populations that are exposed to aflatoxin versus not exposed but both have hepatitis when you throw aflatoxin in there that that risk goes up two to five times um, so it, it's very significant that these two kind of are a terrible duo and they work together to really uh, increase liver cancer and there's some complications with dealing with aflatoxin in certain part of the world. A, a lot of this is related with the food supply um, and the limited food supply, and also the access to technology um, and the money available to spend on agricultural techniques. So in places like the US, we have in these images maybe some contaminated peanuts or some contaminated corn. Um, it costs money to constantly test these for mycotoxins such as aflatoxin. And if they're contaminated, they usually are wasted. They usually have to go to the garbage. You can't use them to feed animals because then they will be contaminated. Maybe the milk or the meat will be contaminated. Um, in some cases, and I'm not sure if this is allowed in the US, I think it's 
not allowed by the FDA, but I've read other things that say it is. Um, that would be mixing in some of this contamination, contaminated grain with uncontaminated grain, retesting it, which is going to be expensive again, just to save it. Um, in any case, this is not feasible in a place that can barely create or can't create enough food to feed everyone. Um, wasting food is not an option and multiple testing regimes that's not an option e either it would make food production too expensive to be feasible so what are some mitigation what are some processes you could do to help um, there are nonprofits that are really working on some of these things such as improve, improve drying techniques um, education for drying techniques uh, how do you properly get the humidity below 15% because that's what you need to do to um, limit the growth of these molds. Um, storage bags that are hermetically sealed and these will prevent aflatoxin from continuing to grow on the grains. Um, there's uh, an organization called Aflastop I found funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Very interesting on protecting the food supply down there. And it takes these bags that are relatively pretty cheap. And if we can provide the bags and be reused, this is a, a pretty good like workaround solution. Um, increasing the diversity of the food supply in places like Africa, where they're relying heavily on corn and other grains for most of their calories, um, where there's a lot of aflatoxins. Maybe we can mix in some other types of agriculture that provide cheap calorie sources that aren't contaminated with aflatoxins and especially hepatitis control. Um, this is probably number one on the list, hepatitis vaccination. Like I said, these two are synergistic. Without the hepatitis, um, even exposure to aflatoxin, those rates are gonna go a lot, it'll go way down. So when you think of aflatoxins and when you think of um, kind of our struggles with it and whether it's in your food, don't forget to think about um, certain parts of the world where they don't have the option to um, kind of test and make cleaner food and make safer food. Um, and it's our responsibility uh, with our resources to help them and to help make sure that they have access. Um, and it's a human right to have access to clean and safe food, I believe. Um, so I think this is an important issue, which is why I did a segment on it. Uh, not too much environmental chemistry here, but we we got to think about you got to think about things sometimes in this in the whole scope of the world. Um, thanks for joining today, and I hope to see you on the next episode, which will be about cannabis. A lot different, huh? Okay, thank you.